we could have everyone's attention. Thank you for joining us in this exploration of the relationship between two superlatively remarkable Torah leaders. Many Torah scholars impacted the Jewish world in the course of the past century, but two stand out in a unique way, Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik and Lubavitcher Rebbe. For me, it's a great privilege to chair this evening dedicated to two great leaders and teachers from whom I have learned so much. Anyone who carefully studies their Torah and the effects of their leadership will see the commonalities that bind them while recognizing the unique contributions of each to both our understanding of Torah in the widest sense and to the rebuilding of traditional Jewish life. Tonight, four leading Rabbanim who live and celebrate the legacies of the Rav and the Rebbe will tell us of their firsthand experiences of the personal relationship between these two men. This is a subject that has engendered much conversation and different views. Tonight, our speakers will present their various perspectives on this relationship between the Rebbe and the Rav and what this has to say about Jewish leadership. Furthermore, they will explore how this relationship challenges us, their spiritual heirs, to ask how can we live their legacy? How can we work together to create a robust Judaism in the modern era that is firmly implanted in and acts upon the world but is not shaken by it? I would now like to call upon Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, Yeshiva University Mashpia and founding Mara de Asra of Congregation H. Kodesh in Woodmere, New York, to give some introductory remarks. Rabbi Weinberger. Thank you, Dr. Schiffman. Chai Harabonim, Chai Virei. This gathering was meant to be tonight. The Torah says, Shamar is Chaydesh Ha'aviv, to guard and to anticipate this time of the year. And from this postic, as the Ramah brings to the beginning of Kiddush Ha'aviv, we learned that Allah has instituted the leap year to ensure that the sun and the moon don't drift too far apart. To synchronize the solar and the lunar calendar in order to salvage some order in the universe that was torn apart by some great primordial catastrophe that's known as Miut Halavana, Pagan Halavana the damage of the moon, the diminished moon. That Hashem created the two lights, the two luminaries of equal stature and greatness. Rav Kook writes in the first Halig of Eres HaKadosh, Kitrug HaLevona, what took place with the moon? There was something that happened at the beginning of time. When the moon was diminished, so Rav Kook writes, Kitra Galavon in his parish, Yorofa Beroze HaNefesh. We can understand this difference between the sun and the moon. In the Roze HaNefesh, in the mysteries of the human soul. HaSeichel HaMor HaGodl. Rav Kook writes that the Seichel is the great luminary, is the sun, man's mind, the intellect. The Haregesh emotions, Hakotan is the moon, corresponds to the moon. And Rabbis Mo'oid has theorized Shebeneya. And there's great conflict, and there are many disagreements between the world of the sun, of the intellect of the mind, and the world of the moon, the emotions. So I must admit, Rabbi Sai, I don't know anything about their relationship. Each one was so loved, and so revered, and so misunderstood. But this much I know, that Hashem Yisbarach lovingly sent two great blinding luminaries into our lives. The Rav and the Rabbi, the sun and the moon, the path of the Vilna Goyim, the path of the Holy Baal Shem, 
Shnei Hama Iris Hagedoylam. Growing up in America, I attached myself as much as I could as a Yankee fan in Queens, growing up and searching for heroes beyond the stadium. The Shnei Hama Iris Hagedoylam. In each one, a leap year took place. The Rav drew so deeply from Chabad Hasidus, the light of the moon, the Rav's heart, the Rav's heart. I once had the privilege of sitting by a Shever Bachis with his son-in-law, Zechar Levracha, who told me that the Lukutai Terror of the Balatani didn't leave the Rav's side throughout the month of El. And he bemoaned the fact, the Rav bemoaned the fact that everybody was seeking his mind, but his heart had been forgotten. The moon inside had been forgotten. On the other hand, the Rebbe, the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Yitzhak Tzuchosigelainu, was himself a Talmud of Brisk. The whole Derech Halimud of the Rebbe and how the Rambam never left his side, the Rebbe's mind, the Rebbe's intellect, the interfacing of the sun and the moon, and these two great luminaries. Again, from the letters of Rav Kuk, Ubedur Sahachreinim, Yofulon Mo'oi, Kolsi Chosum Shal Talmidi Agra, Im Talmidi Habal Shemtev. Rav Kuk writes in a letter that at the end of time, it's so beautiful and so pleasant to see and to hear any dialogue between the students of the Gra and the students of the Baal Shem. Because those two worlds clashed. The sun and the moon clashed at the beginning. The Talmudi Hakro and the Talmud Hashem. So this night is a night of Yofel Onumari Kolsi Chas. How beautiful it is that there should be a dialogue, that there should be an effort made to understand that which drew these tzaddikim together. And I'll end with the tefillah hirotzen that we say every Kiddush Levana. Hirotzen milfanecha Hashem elokeinu v'ukeya v'sayinu. Hashem, may it be your will. L'malois p'gimas halavana. To fill, to repair the blemished moon. V'lo yia b'ashum miyut that the light of the moon should no longer be diminished, that the way of the moon, of the emotions, of the holy Balsham, and the way of the sun, of the intellect, of the mind, that those two ways should be restored to all their previous glory, like the light of the seven days of creation. Hashem Ezbar should help that we'll gain something from hearing the very wonderful, illustrious speakers who have joined us tonight, and that Be'ez Hashem, that this evening will be a Kiddush Hashem, and that all of us will be Zaychim et Hashem together to see all the tzaddikim, Ekitsu, Veran, and Shaykh, and Eofer, with the Gula Hashem, Amitis, Mehem, Yemen, Amen, Amen. Thank you very much, Rabbi Weinberger. Please focus your attention to the screen to view a video of Rav Soloveitchik visiting the Lubavitcher Rebbe for a 1980 Yud Shvat for Brengen, an occasion at which I was privileged to be present.
Rabbi Zvulim Karlam, Dean Emeritus of Reitz, is an authority on Torah and Talmud and lecturer in American Jewish history. He has authored numerous scholarly essays, including The Making of Orthodox Rabbis in the Encyclopedia Judaica and God and History in Halacha from the Perspective of American History. Rabbi Kalam. my remarks with the search I had today. Many years ago, my father, Zechat Salakavach, told me that Dr. Revel, Zechat Salakavach, first president of the university, the founder of the idea and the founder of the yeshiva, had asked my father to go to the Broadway Central Hotel, 1929, the Lubavitcher Rebbe came to America. After international protests, he was confined in prison. He was the only one left almost. The others who fought for the life and the continuation of Yiddishkeit in communist Russia. It was a, a losing battle, it seemed. An absolutely impossible war. And the Rebbe prevailed. If he didn't prevail during his lifetime, ultimately, Yiddishkeit prevailed. And Dr. Rebbe asked my father to go to the Broadway Central Hotel and bring the Rebbe to Yeshiva. Now, I had always thought that it was see, this yeshiva, because this yeshiva ostensibly opened up in 1928. That's when the yeshiva college was founded and when the yeshiva was supposed to move in. And the Rebbe came here in December 1929. And my father dutifully went to the Broadway Central Hotel, as he told me, and he found the Rebbe. I watched the Broadway Central Hotel had great uh, great appreciation in America because there the American League was founded. But in addition to that, we had a much greater effect, and that was the, the presence, much, much of uh, Habdil Elif Alfi Abdullah's the Rebbe. My father came here, and he said the Rebbe's legs were so swollen that it took over a half hour with his pushing and my father's pushing to put the shoes on his legs, on his feet. And then he accompanied down, he told me he accompanied to the yeshiva. So I thought the yeshiva was this yeshiva because we were ostensibly open. And I, so I had a search made by our, our archivist to look all over. And she found one newspaper clipping which said actually that he went to the Jewish center and he was greeted by the Ramaz Magolis in 1929. And I have it in my office and she sent it to me today about five, six o'clock. The only thing is I'm not really very computer knowledgeable that I didn't know how to take the picture out. I got the, the words out, but I couldn't get the picture out from the uh, computer, but you can see here in my computer. It's not an easy task today. Chazal tell us, and we don't really find it in the Chazal, but we found it almost in the, the idea, and very forcefully. We always say, Man Malchei Rabban, who are the kings of the world? And it'll be very much like Rabbi Weinberg's speech, I didn't know on two levels that much, it's Chodesh and this. Man Malchei Rabban, who are the kings of the world? You say, Rabban, actually the Gemara says, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know that Chachamim are the Malachim? That's where the Gemara in Jitten, in Samach Bey's Omer Aleph at the bottom says. And it's out of that you find it nowhere else. Although we always say, Man Malachim, Rabban. 
And uh, they say, come here, Chachomim, a malachim. Now, there are different kinds of malachim. There are some malachim that act as malachim. They do everything, they have a palace, they have an entourage wherever they go. And they have the confidence, I'm the Melech, whatever I say goes. And there are other Melachim, particularly in addition to us, who are Melachim, Malche HaTorah, Melachim HaTorah. And it could be, in our world, a Melech, Mamesh HaMelech, and also a Melech in Torah as well. And I want to tell you two stories of my relationship with Chabad. And I think I see that Rabbi Krinsky is here. And I think he's familiar with him. I know he's familiar with these stories. In 1957, on Tisha B'Av, and no one was home except my mother. My mother was a great Tzadikist. And she used to sit on the floor on Tisha B'Av and cry the entire day. And she said, all of Kiddush, and she knew Perish Hamils, or Perish Hamils. And my father was away on the West Coast, and I'm a Ben Yochidil, and I was my in-laws in Buffalo. And suddenly we got a call that she had terrible pains in her head, and she became blind. And she crawled to a telephone and called an operator. In those days, you could still speak to an operator. And she called an operator and she got the operator. The operator called a friend of hers. The friend had a doctor who was a, a neurosurgeon at the Montage Hospital nearby where, we, where she lived. And he came and he brought the head of the department and he said that she has had an aneurysm. And it's hardly likely that she will live through the evening. The only hope, and it's only the beginning of hope, the skippiest hope, because they just began making surgery. Today, Baruch Hashem, we can cure aneurysms. And hardly likely she'll make it, but she has no other choice. We refuse to accept it from a distance in telephone court. And I said to get another doctor. And he brought another doctor, one of our great friends, who himself became a Baal and he learned about the Tanya by himself with a rabbi Putterman, who was the rabbi in the, in the, in the Bronx, if you remember. His name was Dr. Sikov. Uh, maybe you remember that name as well. And he came to the hospital and he said, he came to the house and he said that we have to get the greatest doctor here. We can't allow this. He was very close. And he brought Morris Bender. I don't know how many of you ever heard of Morris Bender. He was the greatest neurologist in New York. And he said, it'll come if we pay him $500 in cash. Because <laughs> it was late in the evening. It was about 11 o'clock in the evening already. He brought him $500 in 1957 money. Anyway, he came. I was away. We didn't know what to do. I couldn't get in touch with my father. I didn't know where exactly he was. And there were no more planes coming out. It was too late. And finally, we came in the morning, and the doctor took her to Matsane instead of allowing her to go to Montefiore and having this operation. And in three or four weeks, she was lying there. She couldn't see. They said they never, she'll never see again. And she was, she probably had worked. They don't know what it is. And uh, suddenly, one morning she called me up and she said, and to my father, that I, can, I was able to see for about 20 minutes. The doctors don't believe me, they had an hallucination. And uh, we rushed to the hospital, she lost sight again. Several days later, the sight returned as strong as it was before. Then the doctor who saved her refused to allow the operation. Dr. Bender was word around. The Politburo called him in in a time when Stalin was still alive because one of the members of the Politburo was ill and the only doctor they thought maybe could save him was Dr. Bender. He came with another doctor, Dr. Wilder Penfield, it's unimportant. They couldn't save him. In any event, doctor, he came over and said, you know, this is Khalaf, or Charlotte, as he called him. I want you to take an angiogram. The angiogram in 1957 was not as easy and as a common matter as today. But all doctors, don't worry about it, it's 90, 95% successful. 
She said, I don't know what's in your head. I'm afraid that there's something in your head that we may be able to save you. Because you did get blind and you have symptoms. And my mother said, and she was influenced a little by Rabbi Putterman, the Rebbe had just come in, become the Rebbe in a few years. And he said, why don't you let me ask the Rebbe? And uh, my wife said, good, I want you to ask the Rebbe. My father took her, he couldn't understand it. He said, no, 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 no. He just didn't understand how suddenly he said, never talked about the Rebbe. But he said, ask the Rebbe. And he went and came back the next day, and the Rebbe said, fine, listen to this. Find the doctor. who say you shouldn't take the angiogram. He wouldn't say, don't take the angiogram. He said, find the doctor. I told Dr. Ben, the doctor, Ben, was the biggest thing. He said, well, I don't have people coming in. We don't have consults with me, something along that line. And uh, but finally, he said, I'll let him two doctors, either the Houston Merrick or Samuel B. Waters. These were the other great neurologists. Houston Merritt at that time was in Colorado tending to the President of the United States, to Eisenhower, who had a stroke. And he called us up there, we can't come. But nonetheless, he called me up the next day. He had my, my telephone. I waited in the, in the room at the hospital. We didn't have any cells at those days. He called me up and he said, I want you to know I was taken that Bender would allow me to come in. Dr. Bender's the greatest doctor. I can't imagine going against Dr. Bender. But I can't come anyway because I'm attending to the President of the United States now. The second was Dr. Samuel B. Waters. Waters was the dean of the medical school at NYU. And he came and he said, you know, I'm come here because you're a rabbi. He said, said you told my father. And he said, and I want to see you. I was also very much taken that Dr. Bender would allow me. To, this was the first time he was allowed to come as a consultant. And he came and he spent about two and a half hours walking the hall back and forth, back and forth. And finally, he said, you know, I never in a million years thought that I'd, I'd not agree with Dr. Bender. Don't take the angiogram. But I don't know what you'll find there. But if you'll find what he expects to find, or he's afraid he may find, he won't help you in the long run. And if he doesn't find it, you don't need the angiogram. When Dr. Bender came back, he was in an absolute fit. Now, I want you to know, that's Malchus. He was able, as young as he was at that time, this was only three years or so, I don't want to remember if he came, remember? He was able to say, give an answer like that. That was one, one time. The second time, the Rebbe called him, uh, and Rabbi uh, Krinsky was involved in this, about a Chodokov, I think, was involved. And he said, he wanted to see us about me or Yehudi in 1971, right before Shuas, a few days before Shuas. And he said, he wants to meet me. I was the president of the Council of Young Israel Rabbis at that time. And he wants me to get early, who was the outstanding Balabas in the religious world. And that's Kesselbaum, who was that time the president of the Council of Young Israel. He wants to get them. So I said, all right, I'll try to do it. And I said, what time will it be? He said, 2.15, something like that. 2.15 in the morning. I said, 2.15 in the morning, the day before school is 2.15 in the morning. The next day is, uh, it's Tikki Shuas, so we're up the whole night. How can we be two nights on the How can I ask people to come here at 2.15? So I think we was Rabbi Krinsky, or Rabbi Khan, I don't remember exactly who, told me, all right, we'll make it 11 o'clock. So I came 11 o'clock together with the group, and uh, we had to wait till 2 o'clock, 2.15 anyway. So we were waiting. So the thing is, uh, I, I said to them, I said, I know, I have, to, I have to be back. How can they make me wait from 11 to 11? But to nobody left. It was the audacity of that moment. I said, that's Malchus. That's not only Malchus, that makes and genders Malchus. And they knew this, and he knew this as well. Rav Salvechik was a, a giant, you can't imagine what he was. I was in his cheer in 1951 to 54. We learned Liga and Nikvos. In one year, meaning from September to June, 
We did all of Nida with all the Tysus and all the Rashi and Rishonim. Twice a week this year was only two hours. He was in the power, the awesome power of who he was at that time. And we did a whole receptor, and we did half of Mikvos with the long round bombs and the long rushes. They shit me. They shit me. And he would take us to the heavens. And then when he's there and it seems he's got the marble, so he suddenly, oh, 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 oh. and he thought about it, and he'd bring us down to earth again, and then take us up again, you know? It was unbelievable. And I understood for the first time the Tanur Achnoi, when Chazal said, it's not in heaven, you gave it to us, it's our Torah. That was Rabbi Salvechi. I began with Malach Man Malchi the first conversation, and this comes back to Rabbi Weinberg and I close with this. The first conversation HaKadosh Baruch Hu ever had with his creation was when that conversation you spoke about, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Lavana came and said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Eish, Shnei Malochim, Mishtamshim, B'Keser Echad. Two Malochim can't wear the same crown. And of course, Bogle said to him, go make yourself small if that's the way you feel. And later, of course, Bogle couldn't appease the moon. And do you know what? It's Rosh Chodesh. We bring a Korban and Rosh Chodesh. Chatos Marashem. That's an unbelievable thing. Of course, Bogle said, you have to bring a Chatos for him. Because he wanted to tell you how great another was, I think, that the moon and the Lavano made themselves small. So, over there says, Ein Shnei Malochim Echot. Two kings can't wear the same throne, but they can wear different or crowns. They can wear different crowns and be kings. We have come to honor two kings. Thank you, Rabbi Charlap. Rabbi Yehuda Krinsky, who grew up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, received rabbinic ordination at the Central Lubavitch Yeshiva in Brooklyn, New York. He went on to serve as secretary to the Lubavitch Rebbe for over 40 years. Today, Rabbi Krinsky serves as chairman of Merkos Inyan Echinuch and Machane Yisrael, the educational and social arms of the Lubavitch movement, secretary of the umbrella organization Agudas Chasidi Chabad, and director of the Kahat Publication Society. These organizations were set up by the Lubavitch Rebbe, Skronitzalik Lavracha, to direct the activities of Chabad Lubavitch. In 2010, Rabbi Krinsky was voted the most influential rabbi in America by Newsweek. Now, Rabbi Krinsky is still here. I think Newsweek is not, but nonetheless, it was a great honor. Rabbi Krinsky. Good evening, everyone. Baruchem Abon, Kol HaKadosh Azeh. The Rambam, in his brief preface to Hilchus Talmateira, says, Yesh B'Klolon Shte Mitzvah Saseh. Then in Hilchus Talmateira, he will talk about two Mitzvah Saseh, with Zehu Proton. These are the details. One, Aleph, Lil Metera, Beis, Lechabed, Malamdeha, Beis, Vyedeha. And I hope that this evening, which is the Beis, Lechabed, 
will be served to whatever extent we can make it serve. Rabbi Soloveitchik, I knew from my youth. Actually, he knew me before I knew him. He came to Boston in 1933, and in Kislev, December of 1933, I was born, and he was at my bris. About four, four and a half years later, I became what I believe to have been the first registered child in the Yeshiva Sarambam, Maimonides School that he founded, in which flourishes today in, in Newton. Um, to spend 10 minutes in talking about the relationship with, between these two people is, is actually a total impossibility. I will go through some chronology and inevitably in some what I'm, what I'm going to say there's a, a blend, a mixture of my familial relationship with him and in a more official capacity as being part of the Rebbe's Misrad, his office. I go back to Tovshin Bay's 1942. I was not aware of it at the time, but I heard about it much later. The previous Rebbe had come as Rabbi Chalap said in 1929, but went back to Europe in 1930. He came back to stay in America in March of 1940, 10 years later. In 1942, the Rebbe had already established the Lubavitch Yeshiva and some other institutions, and Rabbi Soloveitchik was invited to come from Boston to speak at the first banquet of the Yeshiva. It was held in Brooklyn on Eastern Parkway, a few blocks from the headquarters. And uh, there were no videotapes of that speech that Rabbi Soloveitchik gave. There were no tape recorders. But someone had the good sense to take notes and publish it in one of the Lubavitcher monthly publications at the time, Hakriya Vahakadusha. And reading that speech, and it's in condensed form, you could actually feel in reading it, feeling the, the passion with which Rabbi Soloveitchik expressed his fondness of Lubavitch in general, and precisely the previous Rebbe. And the Rebbe, the future Rebbe, was sitting next to them. He compared the Rebbe to Hanina ben Desa, who, had, who made miracles. The Gemara in Tainus, when there was no oil to burn, he made a miracle and the chemitz, the vinegar, became combustible. And he compared that to the Rebbe. He says to the Rebbe that when the Rebbe, when the Rebbe was in Russia, with all the Mesidus Nefesh and all the stories, endless stories of, of bravery, he and his chassidim, in maintaining the yahadus of all the Jews he could, could possibly reach, if he needed something, whatever he needed, he found, he got. He needed money, he got. There was no money. There, were no, there, was, there was no sorche akhlal at all available. But when he said he needed it, it came. This was, he, he interpreted that as being, he made something, something combustible, he made a fire out of something that doesn't even regularly, normally burn. It's something that if you write us at the office, I could send you a copy of the, of the transcript that is available. Available. It was back in 1942. Fast forward, 1957. Rabbi Chalap mentioned 1957. That was the year I was married, and I became part of the Rebbe's office. From time to time, as part of the Rebbe's office, I had to make visits to Boston. I should say that my father, Oliver Sholem, was a sheikh in Boston for decades. Though there were no official titles, he was considered the chief of the abattoir in Somerville, of which Rabbi Soloveitchik and Rabbi Eliezer Silver, Alayim Asholim, at the time were the, the Kashu supervisors. My father was very mechanically inclined. He was a Boki Bishas in the Midrashim. 
He had a lot of time he spent with Rabbi Soloveitchik talking and learning and working out certain technical things how to make the shkita easier and more kosher, like shears for the sheep, but it's not, it's not for now. There was a very, very close relationship. So when I went home to Boston from time to time, I would tell the Rebbe that I'm going to Boston for a few hours. I would fly up and back in the same day. And uh, the Rebbe said I should try to see, see, visit Rebbe Soloveitchik. And I did. I called him and he saw me. We had a discussion for over an hour about Inyana Diena. And from that point on, over the next 25 years or so, I had the occasion to visit Boston on occasion, sometimes on Sunday, to attend his shir during the summer. The 25, 30 Talmudim from Yeshiva University that would come up and learn with him. And by the way, it's interesting that uh, this group that came up, this Talmudim, uh, when it came to Chedesh Elo, he would learn Lukut Teda, as mentioned before, from the Alter Rebbe. But most, for the most part about Chedesh Elo, and he had a shir in Masech Tenot in one particular year, I remember, for three hours every Sunday morning. And he came, when it came to Chei Shalom, it became two and a half hours in Masech Tenot, and the other half hour was Lekut HaTeda, Mitech HaSefer. And I remember hearing from him many, many times, and many of you may have heard it as well, that when he was a young man, Rabbi Solovitch, a young student, a young bocher, child in Cheder. He had a Chabad Malamed in the city of Chaslavich. And he never forgot the Hislavos in the Gishmak, the fire in Yiddishkeit, in the Limba Dateda from that Malamed. It stood him instead in good stead for the rest of his life. In one of the conversations I had with, with Rabbi Soloveitchik, in the middle of a, it was a long, long visit, he says to me suddenly, Yudel, he called me Yudel, my name is Chaim Yehud, he called me Yudel. Then Tate given an action, a great action. And he explained himself. He says, when your father married his wife, your mother, I understand that they made a pact. They were married a hundred years ago this summer. They made a pact that Yavama, it was 1914, Yiddishkeit was, was, was a non-existent Mitzvah in America at the time. There were no day schools, no yeshivas, no rabbanim, no rebbes, to any appreciable extent. Very, very tough going for Yiddishkeit. People who had just come at the turn of the century were trying precisely to get away from it all, not to get into it. He said, they made a pact, the Yavama, they will raise a generation, if God will bless them with children, they will raise them to be Shemei Teru Mitzvah. I'm the youngest of nine. He knew everybody in my family, Rabbi Soloveitchik, that he was a did hamishpocha. Dovul and Rifkin, Chavkin, Sipa, he knew everybody. And he knew where they were all the time. Some of them were, some of them were shluchim, some of them were, were in other occupations. He knew everybody. But he said, then Tata given an action. At the, the only order that I had into what he said was, I told him, as as my mama, he given an achmer action with the Tata. And it's, and, and it's true, and it's true. There came a time, sitting in the office, the Rebbe's office, I get a call, and uh, the secretary tells me that Rabbi Soloveitchik wants to talk to you. I took the phone, of course, and he spoke to me about a certain Lubavitch young man who was a sheikhet, who was a sheikhet in uh, an abattoir in where the United Nations is now standing. And uh, he left the job. He left Shkita. He says, I want you to see that he come back to work. And I said, I happen to know that he left the Shkita, and I know why he left. He left because the, 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 the line went too fast. He, he couldn't be made because Khalaf between the Shkitas, etc. And he, he couldn't get himself to acclimate himself to that. And Rabbi Salavish said, Ved Denzel's Anna Sheikh Ibn Who else should then have the responsibility to have it? A few years later, I had another call from Rabbi Salavajik. And this was not from him, I'm sorry, it was from his brother-in-law. 
he had a brother-in-law by the name of Simi Gerber. Simi Gerber was a geschmack young man. He was an attorney, a very successful attorney, and a ish hachesed betachlas. He was a friend of the family, and I knew him well. And he told me that Rabbi Soloveitchik told him to call because his mother just passed away. Rabbi, Solove Rabbi Soloveitchik's mother passed away. There was a grave digger strike. It was middle of the winter. And what can he do? He wanted the Levi to be Baisa Hayyim during that day. And I wondered why is he calling the Lubavitch Rebbe's office? And I told Simi, I'll get back to you as soon as I can, hopefully within an hour. I'll have to make some calls and see what can be arranged. What happened was, I was able to make the right contacts, and the, the union, the grave digger union, made an exception, and they prepared the grave. The Levi and the Quarter was Be'ese Hayyim. But shortly thereafter, when I had met Rabbi Soloveitchik, and he said to me, Rebutal, I am eternally grateful to you for what you did for my mother. I'll never forget it. There was a Lidus between him and the Rebbe going back to the years in Berlin, several years in the 1930s. They were visiting and learning the same institutions. Their tracks crossed very frequently. They had conversations with each other. And each one had the opportunity to size up the kishrenes, the talents, of each other. Rabbi Soloveitchik told some Lubavitcher younger light in Boston, several years after the Rebbe became a Rebbe, the Rebbe became Rebbe in 1950, this was in the mid-50s, he says to them, you young men think you know the Rebbe? I'm telling you, you thought when he became a Rebbe, he would be more begoli, you would understand him better, you would know what, what he has made. And I'm telling you, even though some things turned out to be that way, I am telling you that he is still a nister. You'll never really understand the omke or the shure, this individual. In one of the visits I had with Rabbi Soloveitchik, it goes back to about 19... That would be 1979. In the middle of the, the, middle of the talk, it was at his home, the home of his, uh, his daughter in Abington Road in Brookline, Tversky. He suddenly says to me, I have to, be by the, I have to see the Rebbe. And uh, I, I just said to him that, look, if there's anything I can do to facilitate it, um, I'm at your service. It was about six or seven months later that he came with the help of Rabbi Heschel Schechter, whose son I met tonight for the first time, but I knew Heschel very, very well in the Bronx. We had a lot of business, quote unquote, together over the years in the Yom Tziburium. I remember his years in the Yami, uh, his, his chaplaincy, and, and about his chaplaincy. I had two brothers in World War I. I knew what it was like and very well. I remember it very well. World War, I'm sorry, World War II. Um, that uh, brought him. He, he told Rabbi Salavechik that if he, he want to go see the Rebbe, I am at your service. I will drive you. I'll pick you up. I'll take you there. I'll take you back. And he came. You saw the pictures, the photographs before up front. I remember that he'd been very, very well. And um, Rabbi Soloveitchik said that he would be coming just for a very brief visit. It was late at night. The Fabringen started at 9.30. He used to last till the wee hours in the morning. <laughs> you heard Rabbi Halab, 2.15 in the morning, the Rabbi would receive visitors. Yes. And um, he wanted to leave. He was planning to leave early. And uh, the people who brought him were telling him, you know, Nodding to him, you know, it's getting, it's time, it's time, it's time to go. He said, no, 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 he held up his hand, no. He sat for over two hours. One of the remarks he made uh, the next day to someone who visited him, made two interesting remarks. 
One, he said that he was very, very surprised to see that when the Rebbe spoke for four or five hours on end, he doesn't have any notes in front of him for reference, for source material, or for quotes. Nothing, nothing, not a scrap of paper. That was one thing that he, that, that, uh, he wondered about. Another thing he said, this is very, very remarkable. He says, now he understands why Yena Hanovi, Yena Hanovi, the Gemara says that he, from, he, 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 he became a Novi by being at Simcha's Beis HaShayeva. The Simcha and the goings on in the Beis HaMikdosh, in the Simcha's Beis HaShayeva, was Misha Lera Simcha's Beis HaShayeva Lera Simcha Miyamav, that brought him Nevius. And he was, he was talking about how he felt in the Rebbe's presence, listening to the Divrei Teda. He made four siyum in, 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 in one night. There was an interesting exchange when Rabbi Soloveitchik came to be Menachem Oval the Rebbe. After the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Zimchana, passed away, it was four days before Yom Kippur. She passed away in Vov Tishrei Shabbat Shuvah, so the Shiva was cut short. Rabbi Salavechik came, the Menachem of the Rebbe, and there was talk divaritative. At one point, they were talking about the din of an Einon. When is the Einon, a person who becomes an Einon, when is it over? The night after the Misa, or is it after the Kvura? And the Rebbe said to Rabbi Salavechik that the Ramam zokt dos endiksach mit zman akvura. And Rabbi Salavechik said to the Rebbe, Lubavitcher Rebbe, I was standing there, Lubavitcher Rebbe, there's no such Rambam. And the Rebbe says, I know there's no such Rambam in the Yad, Yad HaHazoka, but there's a Rambam in Pirish HaMishnayis, in the Sech Tadumai, where it talks about the issue of an Einan eating, eating, eating maithness. The Yachalti Be'eni Mimenu, so the Rambam says, Ad HaKvura. Which, is, which means that uh, the Kfura is the, is the Siyam Haninus. And, that, and it remained that way. A week after the Rebbe got up from Shiva, he wrote Rabbi Salavechik a letter, and he wrote to him. Fascinating. He, says, he, wrote, he wrote to him that after he spoke to him, after they spoke during the Nechem Avelim, he found a hitzo, a pub, a, a hitzo of the Rambam, in Pirish a different, a different, a different, a different uh, edition. And those words, Le'echalti Be'ini, Ad Hakfura, were crossed out. They were, they were deleted. Which meant as follows, that the truth, the Rebbe was right, because that's, that we, Pirish we have. You do look up uh, Pirish Arabim, Shnayis, Perak Aleph, Mishnah Beis, and Demai, you'll see exactly what the Rebbe said. But he wanted them to know that really Rabbi Salavechik was correct, because there was a Shinri ha Hanusach. And Rabbi Salavechik remarked, that is Emes Alein. He's the, he's the epitome of truth, the Rebbe. By doing, doing this gesture, he didn't have to write it. He, he, he could have remained correct. He wanted Rabbi Salavechik to be correct. And they were both correct. And this is Derech Talmid HaChachomim, Mocham Shaltera. So much. I just want to conclude with something that I found interesting. That when the Rebbe established the Mifsa Neshek to a campaign that Jewish women and young ladies, young girls from the age of three, should light Shabbos, out of Shabbos and out of Yontif candles. Not only the married women, but from three years old. And it spread like wildfire. It was a very, it's a very geschmacker thing to put on, put on Shabbos Licht and Yom Tif Licht. And uh, there were Ketrugim on it, and the Rebbe did it. One evening I called Rabbi Soloveitchik and I asked him, what was the minhik in Brisk with regard to young ladies uh, putting on Shabbos and Yom Tif Licht? And he says, yes, the young girls did it. The Fedish did it. But he doesn't remember if it was from three years old or not. They didn't know if there was a deek on that. But yes, there were Mahadir and Brisk, young girls, 
you should put on Shabbos, Shabbos and Yom Tevlech. I remember when I was a child, seven, eight years old, the first two nights of Pesach, I went to shul with my dad. It was a Lubavitch shul, Anshi Lubavitch in Dorchester, a few blocks from where we lived. And the first two nights of Pesach, I noticed that Rabbi Salavechik came to the Lubavitch shul to daven to daven Maidav. The first night and the second night, and then the next year, the same thing happened. He lived, I, he lived in, in, in Roxbury. I know, I know where he lived. It had to be over a mile. It was, what's it, 20, 20, 25 minutes, maybe 30 minute walk each way. Pesach by night, you have to rush to make a seder of Shleit and Shulchan Aruch for the kinder. And I asked my father, why, why did he show up? Why did he show up uh, those two nights? And only those two nights. Because Rabbi Salavechik knew. And he helped from the Delta Rebbe, Shnei Zalman Avaladi, Everybody who knows who, who pays attention to what he when he when he talks, the Pumi, he said the Alter Rebbe was was a genius chain Mehu. In fact, he once held a speech and he said, "You'll soon see with whom I hold with the Gura with the Shnei, uh, Shnei Zalman of Ladi." I'm not going to say what the conclusion was. You can understand what it was if I'm telling you the story. But the Alt uh, Rabbi Salavechik knew that even though the Alter Rebbe passed in his Shulchan Aruch that on the first two nights of Pesach, you do not say halal, but in the Siddur, in the al Rebbe Siddur that he wrote after the Shulchan Aruch, it says that you should say, you gave him halal, you make a bracha. So that's why Rabbi Salavechik, I don't think people didn't know this, but Rabbi Salavechik came to the Lubavitcher Shul, Pesach by night, walked in both nights a total of at least two hours, just to be Mikhaim, the al Rebbe's Takona, oh, that I have shit to, to, uh, to uh, say Gans Hala. I want to conclude with something. Uh, it's very strange. I brought with me a letter that some young light from Kuntres Beis Yitzchok from Yeshiva University sent to me back in 1982. Rav Meshe Sherman and Rav Yitzchok Wolf. And in this letter, they enclosed a letter to the Rav. I brought it with me, and I'm going to tell you what it is in a moment, and I'll conclude with that. But when I was sitting, when I came to sit down here in the, sh- in the seat, Rabbi Schechter brought me this piece of paper. This is the cover of a gift that I published in honor of one of my grandchildren's weddings a few years ago. And I included in that gift uh, certain things from the Rebbe that nobody else ever had access to before, some writings of the Rebbe. And I was going to mention it tonight, and I will. And he, say, he says, what's your name? I say, my name is Krinsky. He says, is that you? I said, that's me. I said, uh, I said who should talk about it? I'm going to find about it. You go, is that my name? Is that my name? Is that who's going who's gonna, to? Who's gonna? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm preempting you. You'll forgive me. Uh, it's a letter that was sent to the Rebbe, as I said, ni- to me, 1982, enclosing this letter to the Rebbe, where they asked the Rebbe, uh, it was a 40-year anniversary of Rabbi Salavechik uh, being the, the, the Rosh Hashiva, whatever the title of the, the, the official t- uh, title in, in, in Shiva University, in Yitzhak Rabbi Tzikol uh, They asked him for, uh, to contrib- contribute some divrei teda to a chaveres, to a pamphlet that they were publishing in honor of Rabbi Salavechik. And the Rebbe writes to that, he writes, Saviyat Koche, the writing, V'nochin, but made made. It's a very, very proper thing to do, to publish this chaveres, the Breteda, in honor of Rabbi Salavechik's 40th anniversary. Then when they ask him, they write, I'll read you the Russian, the language that was sent to the Rebbe, and then what the Rebbe did with him. The two people I mentioned before, Yedimanu, we know, how deep the connection of friendship, the friendly and the honored relationship between the Rebbe and Rabbi Salavechik, and the Rebbe encircled those two lines that I just read to you, and the Rebbe writes, Ksaviyat Koche, Harbe Yeser me Asher Yodim. That that connection 
that you did us and the Haros and the Harocha is a lot more than anybody knows. And as far as the Divinity is concerned, the Rebbe said that the Beis Harav, the house, the whole house, the Beis Harav Chabad, it's not known to do that, but he gave them carte blanche to print anything they want in that Chiveris in the name of the Rebbe from the Divinity that is already published, and there's, there's, there's a lot of it. So there's so much more to say, but I was given 10 minutes. I think I overran my time. Uh, but I want to compliment Yeshiva University for arranging this gathering. I think it's long in coming. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. And I see the turnout was very, very uh, uh, supportive of the idea. And uh, I'll conclude with wishing you all that I would wish Achim Shal Pesach a gesunden Zummer. We all have a healthy, healthy and happy summer. Mesudas Tevis, Nachas from Kinder, and all of the Zachim, Kfi Meshalas and Vav from the Teva. Thank you very much, Rabbi Krinsky. Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Shafter is University Professor of Jewish History and Jewish Thought and Senior Scholar at the Center for the Jewish Future at Yeshiva University. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages from Harvard and received rabbinic ordination with Sifta Torah Vidas. He graduated from Brooklyn College in 1973, summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa with the Abraham S. Goodhart's Award for Excellence in Judaic Studies. He is the founding editor of Toru Mata Journal, a prestigious academic publication, which has gained international acclaim. Before Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Shafter speaks, I would like to ask everyone to give their attention to the screen for a short video.
very uh, moving for me uh, as the son of Rabbi Herschel Schachter to uh, once again to see this uh, presentation of my father. We commemorated his first yard site on Yud Nissen before Yom Tiv. And uh, brings back tremendous memories of the occasion of when that video was taken in my parents' apartment and brings me and us to a time and a place that was uh, extremely precious and extremely important. My father, Zechorna Levracha, had a very close connection to Lubavitch. When he was a Bachar in the mid-30s, he used to learn Tanya with Rabbi Yisrael Jacobson. 
Rabbi Jacobson, Rabbi Israel Jacobson was the senior representative of Chabad in the United States before the Friedrich Rebbe came. And he had a little Chabura of Bachram in Brooklyn who on Matzoi Shabbos would learn Tanya. And that was my father's first exposure to Tanya. And he loved, he loved Rev Jacobson. Through Rev Jacobson, my father was on a very small committee in 1939, headed by the late Sam Kramer to bring the Rebbe Rayatz, the Friedrich Rebbe to the United States. Rev Jacobson's daughter, Rachel Oldtime, the wife of Rev Muttel Oldtime, wrote a book describing that whole Parsha. It's a fascinating Parsha. We were very close with the old times. And uh, my first seven years in yeshiva were in the Lubavitch yeshiva in the Bronx. And our Rosh yeshiva was Reb Mahal Altai. 1956, my father went with a number of rabbis from the Rabbinical Council of America to go to Russia. And he spent an entire night with the Rebbe before he went. And the Rebbe told him, Here's who you have to meet. In this city, you have to talk to this person. In this city, you have to talk to that person. 1964, my parents went around the world. And I'm very honored that my mother is here to honor me and us with her presence. My father went the whole night. Thank you. My father spent the whole night and I remember he told me how the Rebbe went country by country without any notes, without any paper. Country by country, went through 30 countries. Who you have to see, who you have to go, and to this person you have to tell them this. And it was a very cryptic message, it wasn't clear at all. But the Rebbe had a rice, everything that was going on, and he knew who was holding where and what and who needed what to and they spent the whole night, many, many hours. My father took me to Ferbrengen of the Rebbe every month in Sholosh Regalim for Sukkot and Pesach. Shavuos, I was in Yeshiva. I was learning in Yeshiva in Philadelphia. So I wasn't home for Shavuos, but I was home for Pesach and Sukkot every month in Yantiv. We would drive down to 770. The Rebbe was still going strong. There was no microphone yet. There was still Yantiv. And we spent hours, I was mesmerized, listening to the Fabrengen. When my wife and I were engaged, we came to the Rebbe for a bracha. So uh, we got there at 11 o'clock, and the line was around the corner. But the Rebbe Label Groner, Bituva Hagodl, brought us right to the front of the line. By 11.02, we were in and had yechidus with the Rebbe in the schos of my father. And in 1980, as you heard, uh, my father was responsible for bringing Rav Soloveitchik to the Fabrengen on Yud Shvat, Tov Shin Mem, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the, the Rebbe's taking over the helm of the leadership of Chabad in the United States and in the world. My father was also very close to Rav Soloveitchik. We have a Mesora in our family that uh, 1941, when Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik was Nifter, Rabbi Moshe was a Rosh Yeshiva here in our Yeshiva. After a couple of months, his son, Rabbi Yashaber, became the Rosh Yeshiva. There was a backlog of Bachram waiting to get Smicha. Dr. Revel, who was the president of the Yeshiva, and Rabbi Moshe both died within three months of one another. And the whole Yeshiva was never falling apart. And it took a while for things to get back in motion. And my father, Zechrein of Levracha, was the first one in to get smicha from Rabbi Yashaber after he became the Rosh Yeshiva, the first of some 2,500 boys who Rabbi Joseph P. Salavechik gave smicha to. He gave smicha to more people, to more Rabbanim than anyone in the totality of Jewish history. And my father was the first one. And so we have uh, Sharon from both sides in our family. I feel that I'm here uh, representing my father's a friend of the Bracha, if only he could be here. But I'm the representative, and I want to share a little bit. And I want to to share a little bit historically, and I prepared a handout that I will be Makatzer 
just to highlight for you what it is that I have here, and then I hope you'll have a chance to take it home and read it carefully because every word is very, very significant. I want to say how much of an honor it is for me to be here with my fellow presenters this evening, both from within our yeshiva and also from Lubavitch. And I also particularly want to thank Daniel Fordham, who's the head of the Chabad Club at Yeshiva. Where's Daniel? Where's Daniel sitting? I want to thank Daniel very much. This meant so much to you. It was supposed to be a couple of months ago, and you persevered, and you get a tremendous yeshekayach, Daniel, for the mamish mesiris nefesh, and you pushed it, and you pushed it, and Baruch Hashem, we are here in your zuchos. We're sitting and standing on your shoulders. Thank you. In order to understand the relationship between uh, the Rav and the Rebbe, we have to go back a few days and um, have the same challenge that Rabbi Krinsky had. How could you be, how could you say what you have to say in such a short period of time? But my father used to say, Asadah mitzvah saseh in the Torah. And the mitzvah saseh in the Torah is Ketziras Ha'imer. Ha'imer mitanalaf. So sometimes, Nebuch, you have to be Mekayim, the mitzvah saseh of Ketziras Ha'imer mitanalaf. So that's what I have to do tonight. So we have to start with the Rebbe Rashab and Rebbe Chaim Brisker. I'm just going to walk you through what's here. The Rebbe Rashab, Rebbe Shalom Dovber, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, was Nifter in 1920. The Rebbe Rashab was a contemporary of the Zayda, of the Rav Zayda, Rebbe Chaim Brisker. They had an incredible relationship, but we know about the relationship from the Friedeker Rebbe, from the Rebbe Rayatz who has a number of igris in the igris kodesh of the Rebbe Rayatz about the relationship between his father, the Rebbe Rashab, and Rabbi Chaim, and also from uh, Sichis that uh, the Rebbe Rayatz gave. And I have just a few examples on page two uh, from a letter he wrote on Vav Nissen Tav Shin Beis. He talks about the close relationship. And then a sicha that he gave in Yutes Kislev in Tav Shin Aleph on the bottom right-hand side of page two. He writes, and I'm going to read it, it's the second column on the right-hand side. In your Tafresh and in Zion, which is 1897, in their cloud arbit. They locked up their unity when it came to work for the Tzibor. And he continues to say that there were some people who were, wanted to arouse uh, Shtekel Machleikis, to bring back the old Machleikis between the, the, the Goen and the Balatanya, and uh, Reb Chaim Brisker was very upset and quieted them. All this in a Sicha from the Rebbe Rayat, Yotes Kislev Tav Shinal. On page three, there's a fascinating story I found in Ishim Vishitos by Shlemi Yosef Zevin. Zevin tells a story about uh, when the Rebbe Rashad wanted to build the Babaji Yeshiva and he wanted to build it out of stones. But he had a shtickle, a shtickle uh, kpeda because there's a tzavah of Rebbe Yudah Chassid that in Chutzlar it's you don't build buildings made out of stones, made out of Havanim. So he didn't know what to do. He was a shtickle uncomfortable. So he sent a letter to uh, Rebbe Chaim Brisker that he should pass in the Shaila, you're allowed to do it. And Rabbi Cheskel Abramsky, Rabbi Zevin tells us, was in the room. And uh, Rabbi Chaim tells Rabbi Cheskel Abramsky that he should pass in, that it's uh, permissible. And not only is it permissible, but he also gave a brach. The bottom of page three, there also is uh, evidence of the relationship between the Rebbe Rayatz and uh, the Briskarov, the Grizz, Hagan Rabbi Yitzchak Ze'ev Halevi Salavechek. Uh, son of uh, Reb Chaim. That's, I gave you the reference in the Rebbe Rayatz's Igris Kodesh. I found in an article in Yeshurun that was uh, published in uh, 2001 about some tension between Reb Meisha and uh, the Rebbe Rayatz, the Friedrich Rebbe, which actually involved uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. Apparently, shortly after the arrival of the Rebbe Rayatz, in the uh, Kriya of HaKadusha, we heard earlier uh, from Rabbi Krinsky about the Kriya of HaKadusha, 
apparently the Rebbe said, and I have no uh, independent verification of this from either side that I presented to you uh, just based on the text that I have and now that you have in front of you, basically said that we shouldn't learn by the Kabbalah that it's better we should learn uh, other Mesechtes, we should learn Mayid, we should learn Bavakama, uh, we should learn Shor Shanogach. And uh, apparently this aroused the uh, upset of some of the Litvisha Rashi Yeshiva. And uh, Shleima Haiman, who was the Rashi in Vidas, came to Ramesha Salavechi and said, we have to do something. So Ramesha told his son, Rav Yosef Dov Salavechi, he should write something against this, but he should do it with a seed of pseudonym. He should write an article with the Sudan's Zomish Vis and who it is, but he should make a macha against what apparently, allegedly, supposedly uh, was being uh, presented. The Friedrich Rebbe found out about it. He found out who wrote it, called the Rav in, and uh, they had a conversation. Uh, obviously, we're not privy to that conversation, but it's clear, and that's clear from the next few pages, that the Friedrich Rebbe and uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik had a very, very close relationship. There's tremendous uh, evidence about this. On page four, there's a letter uh, to uh, Reb Meisha Soloveitchik just a few weeks before he was nifter, telling how upset he was. Um, he, the Rebbe writes how he sent the son-in-law, Reb Shemariya Gurari, to go visit Reb Meisha. And Nebuchadnezzar found out how sick he was. He was nifter two weeks later. He sends uh, Igeres uh, Tanchumim, to uh, the family, to the Almana, and then singles out. He singles out the Rav Salavechik. And then in a beautiful letter, and I wish I had time to unpack this letter, he writes 11 weeks later, he says to the Rav, he writes a letter to Rav Daiv. he says, I heard that you're mourning, and you're mourning too much. The level of, of intensity of your availus is too much. And, and I hear, and I'm hearing that you're feeling very lonely. And I'm hearing that you're feeling very forlorn. But I want to give you chizuk. And he writes with such varmkeit. And we have the letter, and now you have the letter. You should read it. It's a lesson in sensitivity. And it's also, it's also a shtickle, uh, takes a shtickle pleitzes. To tell somebody who's an avelus, you're, you're a shtickle overdoing your avelus. And don't think that you're so alone. <laughs> because there are a lot of G'dayli Yisrael who hold of you and who think that you're somebody and don't think that you're all by yourself and that you're lonely. Read the letter, it's beautiful. Rabbi Kinski mentioned a speech in 1942 that the Rav gave when uh, there was a dinner in honor of uh, the Lubavitcher Yeshiva in New York. He came from Boston, or Kenina Ben Daisa. So our Yeshiva in the archives of Yeshiva University, we have a pamphlet uh, from which I took uh, page five it's about a 45-page pamphlet. It has summaries of all the speeches uh, that were given. Uh, and you have the uh, inhalt, you have the table of contents, and I just Xeroxed uh, the first part of Rav Salavechik's talk. On page six, we get to the relationship between the Rebbe and the Rav. This is a letter that the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe Rayatz, wrote to a rabbi in Boston by the name of Rabbi Moshe Rabinowitz. The Rav came to Boston in December of 1932, and it didn't take long for him to butt heads with some of the local Rabbanim in Boston. Issues of kashras, issues of chinuch. It wasn't a smooth uh, relationship. And uh, the Rebbe Rayatz, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, heard about it and wanted to go defend the Rav in the face of the pressure being put on him by various unnamed Bostonian rabbis. And he writes a letter to Rabbi Moshe Rabinowitz, who was uh, then living in Boston. And he writes about Rabbi Soloveitchik. And I just want to read these three lines because they're more directly Nagea to the subject for this evening. Second paragraph. In his inner core being, so I already know him and I know of him from the time that he was in Berlin. I'm on the bottom right of page six. The Chosni and my Aidim, Harava Gano Amiti, Harava Chosid Ishu Eshkolas, Mrenurav, Menachem Mendel Schlieder Schneerson, Siper Li Harbe, Oydos Goigel Ma Loso, the Limud Ubemerans. 
So my son-in-law, the Rebbe, not yet the Rebbe, my son-in-law, told me about the godless of Rav Salavechik, Goigel Ma'a Loisa Belimud Ubemeret. There is actually a lot of debate uh, about what was the nature of the relationship between the Rav and the Rebbe in Berlin. Uh, the family of Rav Salavechik uh, doesn't believe that there was uh, a close relationship between the two of them uh, in Berlin. Uh, others uh, say that there was more of a close relationship. We heard about it uh, earlier this evening. Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld, who was a very close Talmud of Rav Soloveitchik, uh, has an interview where he says that the Rav told him, and I'm quoting now in Yiddish, if can meyed sein, erat nisht farfalt ein tog mikveh. That the Rabbi Soloveitchik said about the Rebbe that when he was in Berlin, he didn't miss going to the mikveh for a single day. So that bespeaks a certain level of a relationship. Uh, although, as I mentioned, there were those who, um, uh, I wouldn't say deny, but certainly question the intensity of that relationship. On page seven, we're moving now to 1955. Uh, another, uh, perhaps, piece of evidence that the relationship between the Rev and the Rebbe was not uh, that rock solid, at least not at that stage. It's a beautiful letter that uh, the Rev wrote to Rav uh, Dovber Rifkin. Uh, Rav Rifkin, as a Choyne Levracha, was a very chash of a uh, Chabad Chassid. I had a personal connection with him. I mentioned that I learned, or well, I didn't mention, but my smich is from the Sifta Torah Vedas. He was my Rebbe, he was my Yeridea Rebbe. He signed, Rav Rifkin is signed on my cloth uh, Hasmicha. He published a sefer called Ashkafta de Rebbe. Very, very important, fascinating, a thin little sefer. Uh, we have it at home. He sent it to Rav Soloveitchik, and Rav Soloveitchik here on page seven and page eight, Wax is very nostalgic about his connection to Chabad. Uh, Rabbi Krimsky, you see the address in Roxbury where he lived. Uh, we, he lived on Homestead Street. You probably remember where it is in Roxbury. And he also mentions the Malamed. He was very much influenced by Baruch Yaakov Reisberg, his Malamed in Chaslavich, and talks a lot about the Kesha, the close Kesha that he has with Chabad, but he does not, in this letter, uh, mention anything about his connection with, uh, with the Rebbe. On page nine, we're now in 1972, we actually have a handwritten uh, copy of a letter that uh, the Rav wrote to the Rebbe, uh, wishing him a Freiluch and Yantiv, who was uh, written uh, Erev Pesach, and we have some notes that the Rebbe wrote uh, at the bottom. That was in 1972. In 1980, the story about the Fabrengen. In 1983, we heard from Rabbi Krimsky, and you have a separate sheet that I gave out that has this letter, this really uh, fascinating letter. So it turns out that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they did not have uh, an ongoing close relationship in terms of being connected to one another, talking to one another, relating to one another. But other uh, Talmidim of, of the Rav, uh, again, interviews with uh, Rabbi Julie Berman and Rabbi Menachem Ganak say that the Rav told them that sometimes people think that friendship is a question of how many times you actually meet with somebody. But the Rav said, Dafka, in connection with his relationship with the Rebbe, it's not a din in how often you meet with somebody, it's not a din in how often you see somebody, but it has to do with the nature of the relationship. Uh, and it's clear that it was, uh, that there was a tremendous amount of, of respect uh, between the, uh, the two of them. Uh, the Rubs family is uncomfortable with that characterization. Uh, the Rubs family was very angry at my father for having brought uh, the Rav to the Rebbe in 1980 at the Fabrenk, and they were not uh, happy with it. Uh, but what's clear to me, and I think should be clear to us, is that these were two great uh, G'dayli Yisrael who did have a tremendous amount of respect for one another. The last few parshias that we were reading were the parshias of Achimais and Kedoshim. So we're living now at a time, and this evening takes place at a time, of Achimais Kedoshim, Achimais Tahirim, two great Rabbanim and Manhige Yisrael who had an enormous impact on contemporary Jewish life in America and throughout the world. 
And now it's up to us to continue their legacy, to do what we can, to be Marbitz Teira, to be Marbitz Aveda, to do what we can in every way that we can, different ways, similar ways, in order to bolster and to strengthen a Jewish life in this country and throughout the world. Tehei Nishmasam, Tzuras Mitzurah Thank you very much, Rabbi Shafter. Rabbi Yosef Y. Jacobson, editor-in-chief of the largest Yiddish English weekly, the Algemeiner Journal, is one of the most sought-after speakers in the Jewish world today, a teacher and mentor to many across the globe. He was one of the editors of Lubavitcher Rebbe's discourses. He uh, was the first rabbi invited by the Pentagon to present the annual religious keynote to all of the 4,000 U.S. military chaplains and employees of the National Security Agency. Additionally, Rabbi Jacobson is the dean of the yeshiva net. Please join me to welcome Rabbi Jacobson. I had the opportunity on Shabbos HaGadol to spend at the community of the young Israel of Yik, the century city young Israel in Los Angeles. And when its rabbi, Rabbi Elazar Moskin, who was a student of Rabbi Yosheh Ber Soloveitchik in the late 70s and early 80s, read that I'm going to address this evening he said, let me tell you something that I remember. That night in January, the 10th of Shvat, 1980, I was in the Morgan Stern dormitory where Rabbi Soloveitchik had his apartment. And Rabbi Soloveitchik then had a Meshamesh, one of the students who helped him, who was an assistant, who is a physician today, he's actually a psychiatrist today in the five towns, Dr. Barry Holzer. And Dr. Barry Holzer comes running up into my dorm room and he says, a black hat, you have a black hat? A black hat. I say to Barry, what do you need a black hat for? He says, the Rav is looking for a black hat. Why in the world did Rabbi Soloveitchik need a black hat? He's wearing a navy blue hat. What's the problem with a navy blue hat? He says, well, Rabbi Soloveitchik is going now to 770 Eastern Parkway to Brooklyn to participate in the Fabrengen of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And Rabbi Soloveitchik said he wants to put on a black hat. I said, why? What's wrong with the navy blue hat? So Rabbi Soloveitchik said in his uh, well-known English accent, when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. The Hasidim wear a black hat, I need a black hat. So they both went frantically searching, searching through the Yeshiva University dormitory to be able to find a black hat. And if you look at the video, you will see what type of black hat those students discovered and placed on uh, the great head and the great mind of Rabbi Yosha Bar Soloveitchik as the stretched limousine that uh, drove up to the dormitory, uh, picked up Rabbi Yosheh Ber to take him to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was not very comfortable on the road and was a quintessential backseat driver, always wanted to sit in the front seat so he can, in the brisker way, direct the driver and make sure he navigates and takes the right derech in his path. So in the stretch limo, Rabbi Soloveitchik demanded to sit in the front seat. So who sat in the back seat? who enjoyed the luxuries of the limo, Barry Holzer and uh, Rav Schechter and all of the, and the a few other people who accompanied Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, that evening at his visit to the Rebbe. Now it is really moving and in many ways brings things to a full circle that we're standing here in this auditorium, the auditorium where Rabbi Soloveitchik himself 
gave many of his greatest shiurim, his yardside shiur for his uh, for the yardside of his father of Moshe Soloveitchik, his tshuva shiur, and many other shiurim in this room. And uh, the reason I say it's uh, moving and important is because after the passing of his father, the great son of Reb Chaim Brisker, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, Reb Moshe Soloveitchik, and uh, in 1941, right? It was in Tavshim Aleph. Reb Moshe passed away, I believe, in 1941. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, wrote a letter. And in the letter he writes to the yeshiva, to Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khan, and I hope that the successor of Reb Moshe Soloveitchik is going to be his son, Reb Yosheber, because he is the most worthy for this position. He's also worthy for it. He deserves it to succeed his father's place. It's in the capacity of Rabbi Soloveitchik to restore the crown to its original glory and through his presence, through his personality, the yeshiva and its talmidim will indeed be comforted. There was a position to hiring Rabbi Yosheber and the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Shneerson was one of the figures who pushed and motivated and inspired very strongly that he should take the position, he should receive this position and here in this room from which so much of his light and his brilliant Torah came out, we are here to explore the relationship between uh, two of the great G'dayli Yisrael of our generation. Now, there's no question that uh, when I just heard Rabbi J.J. Schechter, who brought up the controversy of how deep the relationship between the Rebbe and Rabbi Soloveitchik was, how some of the members of his family were upset with his father in 1980, I never understood something. And when I heard your words, I finally understood it. And that is that in 1983, for the 80th anniversary of the Rav, as Rabbi Krinsky related, two of his Talmidim asked the Rebbe to publish, to produce a special essay in honor of Rabbi Soloveitchik to be published in the Sefer HaYovel in a book. And they wrote in the letter as Rabbi Krinsky distributed the copies from Rabbi Shechter's booklet that we all know the great respect, mutual respect that Rabbi Soloveitchik and the Rebbe had for each other. And the Rebbe added in his handwriting that the relationship is Harbe Yoiser Mimasha Yoidim. Did I quote it correctly? Harbe Yoiser Mimasha Yoidim. Much more than anybody knows. And when I saw it the first time, I wondered why is the Rebbe writing this to Rabbi Kritsky, to the Rebbe Soloveitchik students? If it's much more than anybody knows, so let it stay that way. But apparently the Rebbe wanted to relate to Rabbi Soloveitchik's st students that they, just as Chabad Hasidim, know very little about their relationship. The Rebbe, Rabbi Soloveitchik, called Ashtik Emes, said the relationship was much deeper than what anybody knows. Indeed, I think a lot of the relationship will remain that way. Two giants, two great minds, two gigantic souls from the house of the Alter Rebbe and the house of Aloshim, the house of the Vilna Gon. And the relationship, the respect, the love is extremely deep, more than will be expressed this evening and hopefully many other evenings. But as Rabbi Herschel Schechter, Zechernel of Rocha said earlier in the video, when they met at the end of Rabbi Soloveitchik's stay at the Fabrengen, in his words, you saw that they really liked each other. And I think you could see it in the two faces. Sometimes people hang around each other for 20, 30 years, but they don't like each other. We all know that. And sometimes people meet maybe once in a few decades. But as they say in Yiddish, the Eugen, the eyes, the eyes tell a story. And if I'm not mistaken, my observation was that their eyes told some of the story. I mean, it's interesting. I saw, I was reading up, and I saw Erev Pesach Tovshin Lamed Beis. Erev Pesach, most Jews I know are busy. Unless you go to a hotel, which in 1972 wasn't too popular, so then you're not busy Erev Pesach. There's actually nothing to do. 
But most Jews, Erev Pesach, are very busy. I assume the Lubavitch Rebbe was also quite busy, Erev Pesach. And yet, from all days, he chose to write a letter to Rabbi Soloveitch at Erev Pesach 1972, responding to a birthday greeting, a very warm birthday greeting of the Rav to the Rebbe a few days earlier on the 11th of Nisan, the Rebbe's birthday with Rabbi Soloveitch, writes to the Rebbe, I want to wish you long life with tremendous blessings in honor of the Rebbe's 70th birthday. And the Rebbe writes the letter back, Erev Pesach, blessing him in return. And then in his handwriting adds, and he says, you know, based on your letter to me, intimating based on all of the great things you wrote about me, I'm taking the audacity to relate to you an astonishing question I've had for a long time. Why don't you publish your Chidush Torah in Gemara, in Toysmus, in Toyske? Why aren't you publishing your Torah? And why aren't you publishing the Torah of your grandfather, Rav Agon, V'chulu, V'chulu, Rabbeinu, Tchum Chayim, Alevi, Olav HaSholem, the Torah of Rav Chayim, we have Chidush Rav Chayim Al Rambam, that's what Rav Chayim wrote after many, many editions of clarifying and dissecting and deleting and erasing and rewriting, so we have the final product of Chidush Rav Chayim Al Rambam, but why don't you produce what you have from Rav Chayim of the way he got to his conclusions, the Shachar the Tire, the Kultulim, which would give people a that will teach them how he thought, what was the process, what was the mechanism of his learning, and he brings a raya from a Gemara in Shabbos, and a raya from a Gemara in Edorim, and a proof from Maal to Rebbe in Kutus Acher and Hilchus Talmud Torah. Eretz, who is 1980 from all days, the Rebbe writes a greeting to Rabbi Soloveitchik for Yom Tif, and he uses the term that he used for many decades, quoting his father-in-law, who used to wish Jews before Shavuos, Kabbalos HaTorah, the Simcha Ubepnimius. You should accept Torah with joy and with Pnimius. The Rebbe probably wrote this thousands of times to hundreds of thousands of people or hundreds of people over the years before Shavuos. But with Rabbi Soloveitchik, he adds to the letter of P.S. in 1980, Erev Shavuos, and he says, mm, there's something wrong with this blessing. He knew the brisker Soloveitchik won't have an issue. Of course, Torah has to be internalized. The Gemara says in Erevin, Arucha b'chol ramachei varim, mishtameres. But the Simcha, here the brisker is going to struggle. The Simcha, the Rebbe country, the Rebbe says, what about the Gemara in Rafa's that Torah has to be learned by Eimo, by Yirim, by Reses, by Ziyah, with all the reverence. How can my father-in-law bless Jews, Kabbalah, Safari, the Simcha? And of course, he said, answers three answers. He writes to Rabbi Soloveitchik, Erev Shavuos. First is the Simchas on the general Kabbalah Sapphira. Number two, the Gemara says in Shabbos Daf Lamed that Rabbi used to make a joke before the Shir, Ubatchi Rabbanan, and then Posach. Then he began the Shir, and they all sat the Amosa with fear. So this is the Simcha before the beginning of the Shir. And three, in the middle of the Shir, in the Pilpul, when the answer is given, Ein Simcha Kahataras Hasveikas. There's no Simcha as the resolving of doubt as Rabbi Chai. Arlap Shlita, so Zayn Gizun mentioned earlier how the Rav and the Shiurim took them to heaven and then took them back to earth and then took them back to heaven before we landed on the moon because Torah Loi Bashamayimi. When the Rav's mother passed away in 1967, which Rabbi Krinsky addressed, the Rebbe wrote him a, a long letter, besides the Nicham Avelim letter, a long letter explaining that there's the reasons not dependent on him, he won't be able to personally come to Boston for Nicham Avelim, and he goes into a whole pilpul, very profound and very brief and concise, but with a lot of depth. If you could be Yotze Nicham Avelim through a letter, and if you could be Yotze Nicham Avelim through a shliach, and he says, I'm going to do both. He sent a delegation of emissaries to Boston, as well as he, he sent them a letter. So these are all... Uh, these are all parts of interesting dimensions of the relationship. But there's something else I want to address. And that is anybody who follows is a student of Rabbi Soloveitchik, either a student in his lifetime or a student of his Torah, of his writings, of his books, of his lectures, of his shiurim. There are so many basic hashkafic, extraordinary ideas where one can hear the resonance of the voice of Hasidus and the many teachings of the Baal Shem Tev, of the Balatanya, and of the Rebbe himself, where they paralleled in many of their perspectives and ideas. For example, 
I think what comes to mind is a speech that we know from Hapardes magazine. You remember Hapardes? Hapardes was an old magazine, monthly magazine of Torah. In 1943 it was, Tavshin Gimel. Rabbi Soloveitchik was the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva Sabin Yitzhak Al-Khanan only for a year or two. And the Chag HaSmicha of the rabbis of the Musmachim of Yeshiva Sabin Yitzhak Al-Khanan at the ordination of the rabbis Rabbi Soloveitchik spoke. Now remember, he's speaking in 1943 in the midst of the darkest era of the Jewish people. And he's speaking to a young generation of American rabbis of the early 40s. And Rabbi Soloveitchik quoted a Gemara in Masechet Yuma. Tomer Rabbanon, the Gemara says in Tractate Yuma, Shimon HaTzadik, who was a Kayin Gadol for 40 years, told his students one year after Yom Kippur, when he came out of the Holy of Holies, I'm going to die this year. He said, why that man? He said, each year when I go into the Holy of Holies, I see an old man bedecked in white. He walks in with me and he comes out with me. And this year, when I walked in and I walked out, I also saw an old man, but he was covered in black. The Gemara says, after Sukkot, Shimon HaTzadik fell ill and he passed away. And Rabbi Soloveitchik asked the new generation of American rabbis of 1943, what is the meaning of this Gemara? And in a fascinating drush, in a fascinating speech, he analyzed the story at length. I'm going to make one point Rabbi Soloveitchik said, namely, Shimon HaTzadik was the great leader of the Jewish people. The Gemara describes from Yuma who he was and what type of tenure he had over his 40 years, like Kaba Neiramah Rabbi. The scarlet uh, thread always turned white. The goat of the Chathas always came up on the right side. Shimon HaTzadik each year walked into the Kodesh HaKadoshim and even though the situation was bleak, he saw an old man bedecked in white. Who is the old man? The old man is Knesset Yisrael, the Jewish people. Yisrael Sava, the expression in Zoyar, or in Gemara, the old man, Yaakov Sava, Yisrael Sava, he's covered in white. True, in the outside world it looked like the situation was dark, but when he walked into the Holy of Holies, to the quintessential core of Jewish existence, what the Kabbalists call, the Hasidic masters call Yechidosh of Nefesh, the Kodesh HaKadoshim of the Jew, he saw whiteness. And he came out with a new optimism, with a new enthusiasm. But he said, this year I walked into Yom Kippur. I walked Yom Kippur into the Holy of Holies and I also saw the Jewish people. I also saw Yisrael Sava. But what I saw was blackness. I saw a future of darkness. And Shimon HaTzadik said, I'm not going to live in this world any longer. Why? Because a leader who cannot identify a positive future for his people is not capable of serving as a leader. It's time for him to deliver the throne to another person. Even in the darkest of times, if you cannot walk into the Holy of Holies and see that your people, your children, your youth has a bright, white, and luminescent future, if you can't see the eternity of Netzach Yisrael, if you can't appreciate the potential for the rejuvenation of your people, you are not capable of being a teacher, a master, a rebbe, a mamik Yisrael, a koyen god. You have to believe in your people, you have to believe in your children, you have to believe in your students. How about the Jerusha Rabbi Soloveitchik gave in Atlantic City? I think it was what you have to do. Besides one thing, if he tells you to leave the house. Whatever the Shulchan Aruch tells you to do, you have to do. The son of Hashem says, say, I don't want a relationship with you. Hey, Jesus. Chutz me say, I'm not leaving you. I'm still connected to you. There's no Ache. Yosef Hashem li ben Ache. From an Ache. From an Ache you make a Ben. The next day, one of his Talmidim, Rabbi Julie Berman told me, one of his Talmidim went into him, I'm finishing, and said, Rebbe, they say in the world that last night the Vilna Gaon made peace with the Baal HaTanya. Rabbi Soloveitchik, the Skiyan of Elohim, came to Rabbi Shneisin, the grandson of the Baal HaTanya. Rabbi Soloveitchik looked at him and told him words that we should always remember and act on. He gave a sigh and said, Zeheb Shengemach Shalom and Eishwitz. They didn't make peace last night. They 
they already made peace in Auschwitz. Rabbi Shem Tov told me he went into Rabbi Soloveitchik a few days after the Fabrengen and he asked him how he enjoyed it, how he appreciated it. Rabbi Soloveitchik told him something that is vintage Rabbi Soloveitchik. He said, I'm going to ask you a question. At the end of Parshish, he sees some Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with a second Luchos, and what happens? His face is shining. Koran Moshe. He has to put on a mask. Moshe doesn't know. Asks the Rav a question that the Rachayim asks. Many ask, why wasn't his face shining when he came down the first time? The first Luchos were superior to the second Luchos. The shine came from the Luchos, apparently. The first time, there's no shine on his face. The second time, with the inferior luchas, psalacha, his face is shining. Why? And Rabbi Soloveitchik said as follows. Open your hearts. This is Rabbi Soloveitchik's mind and heart as one. Rabbi Weinberger said, the sun and the moon. Rabbi Soloveitchik said as follows. When Moshe was on the mountain during the first 40 days, what was he doing? What was he doing for 40 days? From Shavuos till Shavuos of the Thomas. He was learning the whole Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu was a Talmud sitting by the Shear of the Rebbeinu Shalom and he was mastering the whole Torah. He was the quintessential Rosh Yeshiva. He learned the entire or much of the depth an infinite brilliance of our holy Torah for 40 days. There's the light that our Rosh Hashiva has, the one who's dedicated to the study and the teaching of Torah. What happened in the second set of 40 days and in the third set of 40 days? Was Moshe learning? Was Moshe giving shiurim? Was Moshe writing shiurim? No, what was Moshe doing? He was fighting the Kivayafu with the Rebbeinu Shalom. He was pleading, he was beseeching. Rabbi Salvechik said, and I quote him in Yiddish, the Eshte Fertzik Ted is Moshe Gevara Rosh Yeshiva. The Zweite Fertzik Ted is Moshe Gevara Narebbe. Moshe was not a Rosh Yeshiva, Moshe was a Rebbe. Moshe was dedicated heart and soul to his people. Even to sinners, he said, in my lifetime, they will not be erased. Forgive them. Until Hashem says, by Hashem, so and he gave us a kipper. There's a light reserved for the reserved for the Rosh Hashiva, but the real Torah opening Moshe, the light that's reserved for the Jew who not only learns and teaches, but he sacrifices his soul and his life for Kali's throne, that is a unique light. Rabbi Soloveitchik said, I saw the Rebbe in Berlin. I knew the Rebbe in Berlin. I saw the Rebbe many times afterwards. But now I saw him 30 years after he accepted the position of his father-in-law as a Rebbe, as a Manig Yisrael, with all the sweat and the tears, with all the endless sacrifice. Last night I saw Kikara Urpne Moshe. I saw the light that's reserved for the person who gives away his whole nisham, his whole being, for Hashem's children, for Klal Yisrael. And I think, I think, Rabbi Soloveitchik taught us here something very special. And that is, as much as we understand, we don't understand about their relationship, one thing we can say, they both cared. They both cared. When the Rebbe passed away, his son-in-law, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein, Shlita, from Gushe Yetzion, gave a hespit. And he said, whether you agree with the Lubavitcher Rebbe on everything or not, but there's one word that describes him more than anybody else in our generation, and that is, Ichbatiyut. Ichbatiyut is, they asked a the Jew, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And he said, I don't know and I don't care. Ichbatiyut is a word which means, you really care. You're not aloof. You're not detached. You hold your pulse. You hold your finger on the pulse of the people, on the pulse of the world, on the.
the pulse of the reality, you're not detached. And one Mitzayi Shabbos at the Chumash year in Boston, Rabbi Salvechik would give in the winter Mitzayi Shabbos, long Chumash year in I heard from a Yid who was there, Rabbi Vichy and Allah Hashem. He's sitting at the Chumash year, and he turns to the 300 people sitting at the Shia and he says, Rabbi Sai, what is I eat? What to do? Okay, we know the halachic definition. You're born to a Jewish mother, you go through a conversion. I want to know, what is I eat? What I eat? No one answers. What are you going to answer? What's a Jew? No one answers. So he says, is there a Lubavitcher in the house? There was one, but he didn't want to identify himself. You know, he didn't know what's coming, right? So he was quiet. So Rabbi Soloveitchik says, if you want to know what a Yid is, you have to learn the Kutei Torah. Well, Akanya said, what is a Yid? A Yid is two words. Reusa de Liba. Reusa de Liba. Reusa de Liba is a term from Zoya. It means in Aramaic, the yearning, the pining of the heart. The Rav said, Erev Shabbos, you saw Ayid, his gilofen in the gassen from Varsha, to koifen fish of Shabbos. But me gizen, reusa de liba. You saw Friday afternoon a Jew in Warsaw before the war running in the streets to purchase fish for Shabbos. You saw reusa de liba, you saw the ruts and halev, the yearning, the pining, the desire, the attachment. The caring. Both of these giants cared. They were involved. They were enmeshed. They were connected. And they can teach us above all what's this Ruusa de Liba, the Ruts and Halev, the yearning and the pining that is the inherent quality of every one of our people. Because there's no real Achim, there's only one. And when we can reveal that Ruusa de Liba, we have the ability to make Shalom of that day, the Bayrim of Uyi and Hashem Echad, Ushmai Echad, and Eir of Yemei Kumamish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.